Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for this panel uh, coverage of the war on, Ga on Gaza, what the media gets right and wrong. My name is William Yeomans. I'm an associate professor at George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. And it's my pleasure to be with you here today to discuss this crucial topic, uh, to honor Shireen, to honor the fallen journalists. Um, and I would like to thank the Arab Center uh, for organizing this, this crucial symposium. I'm, uh, I'm happy to have this distinguished panel of journalists to discuss Western media coverage of Palestine, specifically in the context um, of Israel's war on Gaza. Just to give you a sense of, uh, or to give you the, the schedule for today, we'll be inv I'll be inviting my panelists to give us brief introductory remarks, giving a kind of overview, a lay of the land, what's their sense of media performance. Then I will begin a moderated conversation followed by a Q&A with you, the audience, as well as those of you who are tuning in online. Uh, for those of you online, you do not have to wait for the Q&A. You can begin submitting your questions as soon as you want, although I recommend hearing what our panelists have to say first. Uh, you can use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit your questions at any time, but those of you online can also email your questions at events I'm sorry, to events at arabcenterdc.org. And for those of you in the room today, you'll notice that there was an index card placed on your, on your seat. Please write down your questions there, and those will be brought up to me during the Q&A session. Uh, I'd like to introduce each of our speakers today, um, starting uh, with, the, on the left-hand side, I guess your far left-hand side, Leila Erien the executive producer of Fault Lines on Al Jazeera English, uh, a crucial investigative documentary program um, that's, that's been a model for, for, uh, for coverage in many ways. Um, Akbar Shahid Ahmed, who's the senior di diplomatic correspondent for the Huffington Post and has been publishing some very important leaks from within the government, um, revealing fissures and you know, uh, cracks, I guess you could say, within governmental consensus and has been an important source of information for me. Uh, finally, Mona Chalabi, a data journalist, illustrator, writer, uh, who works as the data editor for The Guardian US and has been a leading voice in media critique herself. I highly recommend her Instagram page uh, for her illustrated data presentations showing kind of media bias in a systematic way. So. I welcome you, my, my esteemed panel. Thank you for being here today. I want to start by um, asking um, Akbar if you would give us about three minutes of your sense of what's happening in the media landscape, and then we'll move uh, to Leila and finally Mona, and then we'll start our Q&A. So thank you. Sounds good. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for having me to the Arab Center. Um, extremely distinguished panel, so honored to be here. I think we can all start with a baseline of understanding coverage can always be better on any issue. On this issue in particular, we know there are decades of problematic approaches. We know that there's a long history of not just bias, but inaccuracy, um, and a lot of concerns raised, particularly by Palestinians, also by Israelis, by all sides of the conflict, right? I think from my viewpoint where I sit now, being someone who's covered US policy from Washington, from Obama on three presidencies. What I see in this moment is three major problems that are driving coverage to a place where it shouldn't be, right, in media. Um, I'll just enumerate those. The first is kind of deference to officials. Washington loves an official, especially loves an anonymous official, uh, and that anonymous official is almost always extremely opinionated. Um, <laughs> where I see that creating problems with my colleagues and, and with, with me, I think all of us struggle with this, is because officials are extremely controlling in what they want allowed out, and because there's so much government spin, particularly from the Biden administration, particularly as it's had so much pressure on its policy, you get a skewed picture, right? So you get a, a picture that's not necessarily focusing on humanitarian concerns, but gets into either political domestic concerns or kind of, how to put it, uh, to be really honest, kind of uh, covering, covering for themselves, right? 
with that, I, and I see this as someone, as, as someone who does go to events with officials, there's a lot of access and coziness here in Washington. Reporters are often out with sources. These are their friends. These are sometimes their partners. These are their family members. You don't want to anger these people. And to me, the most egregious and appalling thing, some of you may know there's an official called Brett McGurk um, of particular interest to me. The reason I'm so interested in McGurk and people like him is as we cover US foreign policy officials, we so often do it in a way that doesn't look at their context and their history, right? So what does the fact that someone in the, in the Biden administration was in the Obama administration overseeing a devastating policy in Yemen? How does that inform what they're saying today? How does that inform the sense of impunity that the Biden administration is going to offer? I'll go on to gatekeeping, which I think is a major problem in newsrooms. And what I mean by this is, there's a real sense that foreign policy can only be handled by a certain small group of people, right? And because newsroom resources have shrunk to a degree that is really just deplorable, you don't have people being able to report from the ground. I mean, I know this as someone at a digital outlet. I had the opportunity to report from Gaza, from the West Bank, from Jerusalem, and, and that informed me. But I was able to do that because I was able to get outside support, right? But Salem took me on a trip. A lot of people do not have the ability, whether financially, whether from kind of credentials and governments that don't want to let them in. We were talking earlier about the Egyptian government cooperating with Israel in kind of creating this blockade of journalists to going into Gaza. That gatekeeping problem also leads us to uh, kind of having the same old experts again and again and again, right? So because there's a sense of these are the people who talk about foreign policy, we quote the same people to the point where your ears are bleeding, right? You've, you've seen them quoted and be wrong for decades. And finally, there's an aspect of fear, right? So many of you will be familiar with Canary Mission, kind of other groups that go around kind of calling out journalists, right? A lot of reporters are afraid. There's also this rising sense of when you're talking about Palestine, when are you crossing into anti-Semitism, right? So specifically the International Holocaust Remembrance Association definition of anti-Semitism has become a big barrier and a big fear for people, right? Where they feel anti-Zionism or even questioning anything about Israel could get them to be called anti-Semitic, could have them lose jobs, lose access, be publicly demonized. That's a big issue. And I'll just close with newsroom diversity. Uh, I think people understand that this is a problem. I don't think people understand how big of a problem this is. Just to give you some stats, um, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists says that more than 60% of American investigative journalists are white. Only 3% of American investigative journalists have any connection to the Middle East, right? I mean, that's, that's not to say that white reporters cannot do amazing work on these issues, but it is to say you don't have people in the room in editorial meetings who are informed by personal experience, can talk about, look, I have family there, I've been there, I understand what it means to suffer through occupation, I understand what it's like to cross a checkpoint. Uh, and this is also a problem in terms of something I think, Mona, you've spoken about really powerfully, is the dehumanization of Palestinians, right? And because you don't have not just Palestinian voices, but even anyone who's ever met a Palestinian in newsrooms often, you don't have the, those voices kind of saying, how are we framing this, right? What is the image we're showing? What is the word choice we're making in this headline? Those conversations don't happen. And a final consequence of that lack of diversity is when there is this tiny group of reporters of color, people who may have personal ties to this issue, they're also afraid, right? They're afraid to speak up in, in meetings. They're not on the pipeline. They're not in positions of power. And that power dynamic is really important. So those three things, deference to officials, gatekeeping of foreign policy, and the lack of diversity in newsrooms, I think is really, for me, why we don't have the kind of coverage we deserve of the Gaza war. Yeah. Leila? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for being here. Um, where do you even begin with the monumental failure that is the Western media coverage of the onslaught in Gaza? I have a lot of thoughts on this issue. But when I sat down to actually write my opening remarks, that's not what came out. So I just wanted to share with you what I do want to talk about in my opening remarks. And then I hope, of course, to get into the very uh, major and important critiques of the Western media coverage. Um, I wanted to talk about Shirin and how the, legend the horrific killing of this legendary journalist relates to where we are today. 
Perhaps no other killing of any Palestinian in history has been investigated as Shirin Abu Aqla's. Uh, Senator Van Hollen mentioned some of the places that have investigated her killing. The United Nations, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Forensic Architecture, Beth Salem, CNN, AP, Al Jazeera. That's just nine entities that I could think of off the top of my head. They've all concluded, despite Israeli lies, denials, and obfuscation, that an Israeli soldier killed Shirin, and in the case of some of these investigations, that she was directly targeted. And, and yet, as we approach the second anniversary of her killing, there has been no justice and there has been no accountability. If there's no justice in the case of a prominent journalist like Shirin, who was a US citizen, what is the hope for the thousands of other Palestinians killed by the state of Israel just in the last seven months, let alone the last few years, let alone 75 years? What is the hope for justice and accountability for the horrors inflicted by Israel's occupation and apartheid system? For the last seven months of mass killing of children, of women, of men, the destruction of cultural sites, of all that makes and creates and sustains life in Gaza, of mosques and universities, of homes where memories were made, of mass graves under hospitals, of men executed in front of their wives and children, of a grandmother shot while she and her grandchild waved the white flag, of all the crimes that we don't even know about and the bodies that still lay under the rubble unaccounted for. There's so much to say that we could be here all day, so many people to grieve, the other day, my nine-year-old son asked me to calculate how long it would take to recite the names of those who were killed in Gaza. And assuming it's 36,000, which let's be honest, that's a conservative estimate, the answer is it would take 20 hours. I think I can speak for most of us in this room when I say that so much of what we've witnessed in the last seven months has left us speechless. Sometimes there are no words to capture the horror, the outrage, the hypocrisy, the dehumanization, the gaslighting, all that we've seen and experienced. But all we can do is try, including to critique the Western media coverage, which we'll get to in this panel. And what we must not do is lose our humanity or remain silent in the face of all of this. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me here. It's such an honor to be here at an event that's honoring um, Shireen. Um, when I was thinking about what it feels like the media is getting right and getting wrong, obviously there's a much longer list in the wrong column. <laughs> um, I would say that it's interesting. A year ago, I sat down with a journalist who um, is very, very well respected who has done reporting on Ukraine. And I was asking them, do your colleagues, this was a year ago, I said, do your colleagues see any parallels with the reporting they're doing in Ukraine and what is happening in Palestine? And their response was very, very fascinating. I'm deliberately trying to obfuscate their gender because I, I don't think they feel comfortable um, speaking openly about this. They said, all of the photojournalists in Ukraine understand the, understand the parallels. None of the writers see it, which I thought was really, really fascinating. And I think that one of the few things that, that has been a little bit better has actually been some of the photojournalism. I think a lot of the Western press simply can't avoid the use of the, image, of the photographs and including them in articles. The words have, for the most part, been trash. Um, I would say the nouns are wrong. So we saw Israel hyphen Hamas, then Israel hyphen Gaza. We're still not at a place where we're gonna see Israel hyphen Palestine, no matter how much, um, how much violence is taking place in the West Bank. Um, the, uh, the adjectives are also wrong with, you know, and this um, is in some of the analysis that I've done, the way that the use of um, the, sorry, the verbs are also wrong. So the use of the verb died instead of killed. Um, you know, the New York Times was talking about migration early on instead of displacement. Um, and I don't want to sugarcoat it. Th those are lies. And those are lies that are driven in part by ideology. Um, so there has been like very, very malicious deceit. And there's also like, you know, the kind of mundane realities of the newsroom that you spoke about a little bit, right? So, you know, um, layoffs mean that, for example, sometimes it's uh, people who previously worked in the sports section being asked to edit the live blog, right, at the New York Times. People who have no understanding whatsoever of any of the context of what's happening now. 
And what do those editors do when they're confronted with their own ignorance? They turn to the style books. And the style books have enshrined certain language. So the style books say you can't use the word Palestine in your reporting. So those editors will go in and if they see the word Palestine, they'll take it out. Um, you know, I actually know one of those general reporters who um, is a very, very good journalist but has never covered anything with regards to the Middle East before. Um, and who was assigned to, um, has constantly actually been asked by other colleagues at the New York Times, can you cover this, can you cover this? And they've always tried to resist, um, but you know, the, the, the staff was very, very, the newsroom was very, very short staffed, so they were recently asked to cover the campus protests when they first, first began. And this reporter told me that whenever there's a breaking news story, um, the New York Times sets up like a new Slack channel to, to cover it. 100 people dive in to start figuring out how they're gonna cover it. And before a single, a single uh, reporter has been sent to any of the encampments, before anything has been done, the title of the Slack channel was Anti-Semitism on Campus. So you framed every single thing that is gonna happen from there. Um, sorry, I know that's like uh, kind of all over the place, I don't know, just most of it has been bad. Uh, there are certain things that I, um, I find it very difficult, frankly, to forgive my colleagues for. I'm thinking again about a piece that was run in The New Yorker um, that I think was titled like Hamas's Propaganda War that just called out a bunch of Palestinian journalists who are literally putting their lives on the line and implied that they are doing Hamas propaganda. Mentioned in that article was Wa'il Datuh, like, I, I, don't, I don't know how, it's very, very difficult actually to also just stay in this industry and to continue to meet the people who have written these articles and even look them in the face, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, mostly bad. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you for all your opening comments. There's, there's obviously so much to discuss. Uh, you know, one, one question I have was, is about the sort of, increasing reports about the media reporting. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about, I think the Guardian piece on the CNN and the way the sort of editorial flow is happening um, through the, the Bureau, the Israeli Bureau. Um, and then obviously a lot of this critical commentary and reporting on the New York Times. Do you, do you think that that is a sign of something positive? I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to give us something hopeful maybe after <laughs> after your comments. But this question is for all of you. Is this is this increasing flow of media critique something that's resonant? I do think that there's a lot of discontent within newsrooms. And I should say, you know, Akbar and Mona very rightly pointed to a lot of the critiques. And I would say it's it's been a monumental failure. Um, comparable to the lead up, the reporting in the lead up to the Iraq war yeah. in terms of just regurgitating, you know, Israeli official narratives without reporting them out that turn out to be lies and propaganda and that sort of thing. But I think in terms of the newsrooms, I mean, they are a bit more diverse. There's still a long way to go, as Akbar mentioned, the statistics, but they are a bit more diverse. And I think in some ways, not just, um, you know, the people of color in the newsrooms who've been troubled, but even others who've been troubled by the, the media bias are speaking out more and kind of unfortunately uh, encountering roadblocks sometimes within their own newsrooms, which is why it's being leaked. But it's so blatant, I think, in the face of so many people that in the eyes of so many people that you do see this discontent coming out. And just an example of that is in terms of the way that um, the media industry sort of requires, in a sense, this sort of deference to the Israeli official narratives. You saw the incredible reporting by student journalists who were covering the student protests, uh, the encampments, and just how honest it was. It really did adhere to the basic tenets of journalism. Who, what, when, where, how, mm -hmm. tell us what happened. Compare that to CNN, where Anderson Cooper was just regurgitating the uh, government lie and the sort of propagandistic lie that there were outside agitators uh, who were in charge of these protests. Meanwhile, the student journalists at Columbia were saying, absolutely not, these are our fellow students, we know them, we're on the ground here reporting. So you do see sort of with younger journalists, people who haven't sort of been, uh, you know, in, uh, inculcated with some of this bias, a willingness to actually tell the truth, and I think that's really revealing. I don't know if any of you wanted to speak to that. I mean, go ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> Just two quick points. <clears throat> Um, the first is I just, just thinking about how the industry works and, and the fact that, you know, as you both mentioned, that it's, it's in a troubled place, diversity is a troubled conversation. Newsrooms are defensive. Mm 
right? Like, so, so while this coverage I think is good, and I think people are leaking stuff to be honest about what's happening internally, newsroom leaders are probably pushing back really, really hard. And one hears that anecdotally, one sees evidence of it, and so we're seeing a push-pull. Um, I'd also just ask people to, to think about the international stakes of this in terms of these newsrooms have now decided they want to be international news outlets, right? The New York Times does not want to be an American newspaper, it wants to be the world's morning newspaper for everyone. And that's where they are facing scrutiny that they perhaps were not prepared for, right? So that's the question, are, are we covering these outlets as American outlets talking to each other about America serving Americans, or are they really trying to reach everyone? And I think that's the dilemma. I mean, I don't know. I. There are many, many criticisms to be made, obviously, and my particular approach has often been grounded in data just because to be an Arab journalist uh, is to not be believed. Um, so data is a really, really important way for me to show patterns that are systematic, that are irrefutable. Um, and so some of the data I've looked at, for instance, has been the disproportionate coverage that was given towards uh, Israeli people who were killed as opposed to Palestinian people who were killed. Disproportionate is obviously really, really critical there. So literally measuring the number of mentions of Israeli victims compared to Palestinian ones. Um, it's funny, like, I've had a lot of people ask, are you going to continue to do that? Um, I think some of the questions I want to ask have kind of shifted now. Um, if I were to measure patterns of bias today, I think I would ask different questions. I don't know, like one of the things that I'm looking at is how many articles include in their first paragraph um, a mention specifically of October 7th, which is reinforcing a very, very specific, specific chronology that frames people's understanding. Um, I mean, you mentioned like positive things. I'm going to try and find something positive. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I, I would say early on, whenever you heard October 7th mentioned, it was always unprovoked surprise attack. And somehow that word unprovoked has like slowly and quietly slipped away, which is some kind of acknowledgement that it was a lie. Um, uh, the fact that it hasn't been used. I wonder, I wonder if we will get to a place where... Um, the articles don't start with October 7th. I, I'm seeing already that changing slightly when maybe now that's coming up in the fifth or sixth paragraph, uh, which again feels like some kind of progress, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's another way to think about uh, hope or bright spots. So, you know, what are your sort of go-to sources of information and mm -hmm. how do we sustain those? How do we build on those? Is, is this about developing our own sort of institutions or infrastructures mm -hmm. of, of publication? I'm thinking of like Mahdi Hassan's uh, new project and, and you know, where, where can we look for, for sources of information? A lot of people will ask that after these broadside critiques. Mm -hmm. Outside of your own publications, <laughs> of course. Yeah, you can improve coverage by leaking to me. Uh, you can find my email online. Flash his email up on the screen right now, please. I mean, I think the business model of journalism, journalism itself um, is sort of shrinking the space for more alternative publications or news organizations. Um, so in fact, compared to five years ago, you have fewer news organizations or news outlets. I mean, we've seen journalists in Gaza kind of do their own thing very powerfully, people like Matez and Bissan and, uh, and, and you know, others who've uh, managed to gain massive followings just telling the story from the ground. Um, but of course, you do have these kind of, um, you know, massive organizations like the New York Times that unfortunately continue to set the agenda. And I think um, acknowledging their power and holding them to account is important to make sure because the reality is the way journalism functions and sort of the way newsrooms are funded and all of that is that a lot of people get uh, the tone of the coverage, you know, the agenda being set by the big organizations like the New York Times. And um, being able to really break down and critique the problems within is, very, is just as important as establishing alternative uh, ways of accessing media. Yeah. Any other recommendations or? I don't know, just I guess on that last point about the, the problems within, as I mentioned, I think changing the style books feels really, really important, but also interrogating like which pieces are published as opinion and which are published as reporting. And a, I would say a broader pattern that you've seen is again, 
Arab and Muslim journalists being pushed towards the opinion pages mm. for literal reporting. Um, and many of the things that we're stating on those pages aren't a matter of opinion, they're a matter of fact. So I would say pushing back against that as well. Um, I don't know, we just mentioned leaks quite a few times. It still just blows my mind that the New York Times was like, we can't have leaks. Like the whole industry operates on leaks. It's so, it's so embarrassing and so transparent. Um, that fearfulness, um, yeah, anyway. It's a rejection of accountability. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as every, I'm sure a lot of people here know, there was a witch hunt within the New York Times to find the people who had been leaking. Obviously, the witch hunt started with Arab and Muslim journalists who were working at the New York Times who were considered prime suspects. Um, but uh, I think that that movement within the New York Times is growing and it's spreading in a way that actually can't be contained. Um, and there are many, many journalists who aren't Arab or Muslim or Palestinian within that institution who are um, becoming increasingly clear about the lies that are being told. Yeah. Just one more thing I'd just say is, <clears throat> I, I was thinking about this on my way here in the context of Shireen and in the context of your excellent outlet, right? I think. Al Jazeera has, in a way, become such a flashpoint in this conflict. And obviously now Israel has said, we're going to kick out Al Jazeera. They can't operate in Palestine. What's so important to remember is that, again, did not start on October 7th, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there, was, there were years and years of well-funded lobbyists in DC. I, I met with them. People in this room probably got pictures from them who were saying Al Jazeera is doing Satan's work, right? I mean, just the biggest smear campaign. So it's just important to remember. And, then kind of shield the outlets that are trying to do that work from the ground and, and people who speak up. I see people in the audience who have been attacked for speaking up and faced a lot of pressure inside their newsrooms. And I think the more people can speak up and say, well, this person saying this about Palestine is not discrediting them. Keep them in your newsroom. You need them. Don't push them to opinion. Don't question them. Don't say that, you know, this is not a space they should be in. Well, we're also reaching a critical mass where if you're going to say that somebody having expressed support for Palestine renders them an untrustworthy source, you're not going to have anyone left to employ it this way. Mm. Like, there's going to be enough of us who have said something mm. um, criticising the Israeli state's actions, yeah. that it's not tenable. And it's usually a double standard, Absolutely. and it's never really applied. Yeah, as, yeah as of course. I was just yeah. about to say, I mean, just in the New York Times, you have the host and founder of the biggest podcast, Michael Barbaro, retweeting Shai Davidai, who's sort of like an unhinged, virulent anti-Palestinian racist, and calling his thread basically, which claimed that Students for Justice in Palestine was like somehow linked to Hamas, and it was totally like unhinged racism, and saying it's a must read, and he keeps his job and, and faces yeah. no accountability. And meanwhile, you have two writers for the New York Times Magazine who had to resign their jobs for calling what's happening in Gaza a genocide. So you see a blatant double standard in terms of the expectations of, you know, of their reporters, of their staff, when it comes to you know, Israel versus Palestine and what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. So, I mean, it sounds like you, you're all saying maybe you, you have to stay fighting inside the institutions and that there's hope inside these institutions. Or maybe not hope, maybe that's the <laughs> wrong word. But that, that that's the, where the real battle is, as opposed to um, building out more alternative infrastructure of sources, or is it an and uh, approach? I mean, I'm interested in this out, inside versus outside question. I think it's both. I mean, the New York Times has got such a huge, huge readership. When I'm speaking to people who, who work there who are incredibly frustrated, they know that if they can get a piece through, it's going to be read by hundreds of thousands of people. And that if we try and set up these alternative models, yes, they're really, really important, and those endeavours should absolutely be supported and pursued. But you're just you're starting at a totally, totally different place in terms of impact. And so it has to be both. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just think it's very, very difficult to be inside of those institutions right now, especially yeah. if you yourself are one of the identities that is currently... Um, are are you hearing this across the board? Is, is morale among Arab and Muslim American journalists really that bad? I mean, I can, speaking for academia, I can say that we're seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. I, I've heard it from so many people who say, like, I can't stay in this industry, yeah. who've had, like you know, breakdowns emotionally just because of the gaslighting that they feel. 
Um, they just know that if this story were happening to Israelis, it would receive wall-to-wall -wall coverage, it would be on the front page. I mean, so much of the critique we're talking about isn't just what's covered and what isn't covered, it's the tone of it, right? Is it, a break, is it considered a breaking news story when Palestinians die or are killed, or is that just normalized? Is the mass killing of Palestinians something that we're just expected to accept, right? Yeah. Um, so a lot of it has to do also with the placement of stories, the packaging, the tone, the tenor, the use of language. Is it emotive language or is it language meant to kind of obscure Israeli responsibility from what's happened? So I think all of that just adds to sometimes pressure of not knowing if, if especially in some of these mainstream institutions that are complicit in regurgitating Israeli uh, official talking points, mm -hmm. if there's a place for me as someone who thinks differently and is pushing back against those practices. Um, I, I had an interesting conversation with a public editor of a major source who said that whenever they published in the article, they received um, sort of flack, you know, negative responses from the pro-Israel community at a ratio of about two to one over those who are sympathetic to Palestinians. So it seems like they're paying attention to this ratio. What, what kind of advice would you have for media consumers, um, for the people in this room, um, in terms of reaching out and giving feedback? Does, does feedback matter? Uh, and then how, how would you advise they go about giving such feedback? What are effective messages? Unsubscribe. <laughs> Cancel your subscription to some of these places. That's pretty powerful and yeah. clear feedback. Um, but once you use it, you can't really use it anymore, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe. But it's also lasting feedback because for every month that you're not, that you're not sending that, in a way, you could consider that a monthly piece of feedback of like, I'm not going to subscribe to. But you. will they hear that? You know. Yeah, I think that they do. I think that one of the things that I have heard from people again inside these institutions is. Um, Profits haven't changed, so there's no incentive. Our readers seem to think that we're doing an okay job because they're coming back day after day after day. So, yeah. I also don't know if I'm really, really honest. A part of me is, maybe it is two to one, and maybe that person just told you that number because they can say whatever they want to say. And I won't know, yeah. Yeah. No. Um, you know, I don't know if you all know about the billboard that was positioned outside the New York Times newsroom that is paid for by camera. So camera is a Zionist media watchdog. Um, they pay for a large billboard which is outside the New York Times newsroom so that every journalist in the newsroom, it's what they see. And they've done this many, many, many times over the years. Um, it turns out that billboard is run on... Um, the billboard company is called Red Rock. The owner of Red Rock is also a massive Zionist. Everyone's getting along very well. Um, and the billboard at the moment, or the most recent one, I think said something like, the New York Times, why don't you care about the hostages? And this is what like journalists have to see. And uh, interestingly, I don't know if you saw this story, but the editor-in-chief of the New York Times is a guy called Joe Kahn. His father was previously on the board at camera. So it's also in their interest to kind of put up this narrative of like, oh, we're being criticised on both sides, therefore we're doing a pretty, pretty good job. Um, I actually think there are a lot of Zionists who are mostly pretty happy, actually, with the New York Times coverage. Yeah. I mean, for everything I've heard about newsroom leaders is that it does matter for them to get reader feedback or viewer feedback. So I think if people see stories, uh, examples of stories that are good, um, mm -hmm. to make sure that they reach out. And of course, if they see uh, examples of stories that are problematic or misleading or you know, um, otherwise fabrications, it's also important to make their voices heard because that's what we hear is that these things do matter. Um, to Mona's point, you know, the, the Intercept came out with an article a few weeks ago saying that uh, a New York Times memo about language that was leaked to them said that words that reporters were discouraged from using included occupied territories, ethnic cleansing, genocide, refugee camps, and even the word Palestine. And a spokesperson told The Intercept that issuing guidance like this is to ensure accuracy, consistency, and nuance. So that's the irony is like this, uh, this you know, uh, editorial decision about uh, language that's considered acceptable, in fact, shows you know, deep anti-Palestinian bias, but in their minds, it's, it's ensuring accuracy. So I think it's important to even pinpoint very specific things like the use of language, like mm -hmm. which stories are being told and the feedback that readers and viewers are giving. And, and just to your point, I think positive, <clears throat> positive feedback really makes a big difference in terms of convincing newsroom leaders it is worth investing in certain kinds of coverage, in terms of saying, you've improved this, like people are paying attention. And just 
I think people don't understand the kind of metrics that unfortunately in our like super tech dominated world we live in, you can track when a reader leaves your article, right? Mm -hmm. So how far down a reader goes is really important. Mm -hmm. If you think someone's really good, read all the way to the end, like promote it right to their editor. Um, but I'd also say people should not feel afraid to talk to journalists in their lives. Um, I think that there's some amazing stat that most Americans have never even talked to a reporter. Reach out to the reporter directly and say, I found this problematic. Um, I think that's, I think we cannot imagine the amount of government spin that most reporters covering this from the Israeli government, but also from the American government are receiving constantly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think back really often to this one moment um, in January when I was, I was in a briefing with, with a few reporters and one of them asked heads of major aid groups who were sitting with us, so, you know, the Israelis say uh, they need to restrict aid and not let all this in because Hamas is taking all the aid. Aid groups said, you know, Hamas is not stealing the aid. The US government has said that. Then they said, well, it's dual use. I guess my question, to these humanitarian groups, right, after humanitarian workers have been killed at an astonishing rate, saying, this reporter looks at them and says, so do you want Hamas to win? And I think that kind of moment, I mean, that was like a, a, a jarring moment for me. I had to leave the room, basically, after two minutes, um, made up an excuse. Because that, to me, was you're getting so much of one side that you are literally looking at an aid group, a charity that is vetted that you've worked with for years, and you're saying you are aiding what the US government calls a terrorist organization. So that's, that's where reporters are, and I don't think that comes necessarily from a bad place. I think a lot of reporters are open to critique, but are not hearing from other voices, are hearing very much from specific sides and specific narratives. I want to ask you about this phenomenon of, of kind of burying the lead. You know, there's a lot of focus on head, headlines, and of course, there's this criticism of the overuse of the passive voice when Palestinians um, are victimized that, that Mona referred to. But I feel like sometimes when I'm reading these articles, I think reporters get the, the most important things in towards the bottom or towards the end of the articles. Is, is this something that I'm imagining? Is this an industrial practice? Um, you can tell me I'm crazy. I, I, I can give you an example. Yeah. So on the, on the um, story about Biden threatening to pause uh, weapon shipments to Israel if, if this invasion of Rafa, with the invasion of Rafa. And, uh, you know, I was reading this art, the Washington Post article and then about, you know, eight or nine paragraphs into it and says, but Israel has already has enough U.S. weapons to carry out the operation, mm -hmm. and it doesn't include the money that, that was handed to Congress mm -hmm. then over. So I was like, this is actually the lead. This is the most important thing to me, which is that this is just an empty promise of a pause of future shipments, but that there's actually more than enough already given U.S. weaponry. So I don't know, is this, is this a thing, bearing the lead? Or I mean, I'm always willing to suggest that things are nefarious, but I actually think in that, in that particular <laughs> case, um, there is this style in journalism of just constantly assuming that readers are coming to it with no prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so very often those first seven paragraphs are spent trying to explain to people implicitly or explicitly, here are the actors, mm -hmm. here, here are the stakes, before you even get to that, which, which is, yeah, it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating. Is this the inverted pyramid that we hear about? Or? I guess. I never studied journalism, so I'm like also <laughs> interpreting all of these things kind of as I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say, I mean, as you described your example, um, that does happen. I think <clears throat> there is such a push-pull between news editors, copy editors, reporters, that things that, that should be really emphasized, whether it's the fact that you know, there's enough weaponry to do this, or the fact that Biden has not paused support for seven months, right? 36,000 people dead, children, all of that do get pushed down. Um, but I think that's part of kind of supporting reporters who are raising those stakes and not just saying, here is the long history of you know, October 7th for four paragraphs, right? Right at the top of your story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's also a reflection of a wider trend of just completely eliminating context from reporting on this story, right? The fact that history begins at October 7th, even though in 2023 and 2022 were the deadliest years for Palestinians, right? Um, and to me, what that is revealing of is which lives matter and which lives mm -hmm. don't, right? Um, the very basis of the reporting is framed around Israeli lives, Jewish Israeli lives specifically, counting more than Palestinian lives. And all of that is shown in the coverage, right? Like flying 
top anchors from every network to Tel Aviv right after October 7th and having them stay there for, you know, many, many days reporting live. But then when you have, you know, mass killing in Gaza, you don't see a similar kind of mobilization. So it comes up in the language, it comes up in the framing, it comes up in the resources put to it, all of that. And, and that's the basis of it. You know, I think this raises a lot of questions also about trust in terms of official sources. It's been ref referenced uh, several times. We have an online viewer who asked about, um, basically, around Black Lives Matter, there was a shift on acceptance of information from police and law enforcement. You know, is there a kind of parallel happening? Like, is there a little more criticism now of reliance on um, official sources? And one reason why I'm not hopeful is, you know, I'm thinking back to more than a decade ago when there were all these mea culpas and the retrospective uh, uh, reviews about the media failure around the war in Iraq. Do you remember that there was all this soul searching? How did we just? I don't, I'm, I don't remember much soul searching, to be honest. You know, I really well, don't. I, the 10 year anniversary had a little parade, you know, of maybe a few pieces. But it, it's back to the sort of same deference, I think. Or I don't know, what do you guys think about is there, is there, a, is there more critical? Is there a possibility for critical <laughs> reflection on this problem? I think the Black Lives Matter moment also created this impetus for newsrooms to diversify. The impetus existed before, okay. but newsrooms woke up to it. And what we've seen is that that didn't happen, right? With, in fact, what we've seen is two years later, Pew surveyed 12,000 journalists. Journalists said racial and ethnic diversity is actually our newsroom's lowest priority. So actually, I think a lot of the lessons of that George Floyd moment, unfortunately, are lost broadly in the US um, because they're difficult truths to accept. Um, in terms of, of deference to officials, I think the analysis of think tanks and funding and the Washington influence machine has increased and the awareness of who might be saying what and why and how people go from government jobs to working at the private sector to being on the board of, of Lockheed Martin to coming back into government and approving Lockheed Martin sales to Israel or anyone else. That awareness is there in a way it wasn't before but are editors aware, right? I think reporters are aware, but editors who make those final decisions may not be following us as closely. I'd say um, no source has burned American journalists or Western journalists like the Israeli military has, right? Um, they've been caught repeatedly lying, mistreating, putting out mis and disinformation, everything from you know, 2021 when they're going into Gaza, uh, they told a group of journalists that they were going to do a ground invasion, and then they later on, and, and the journalists re reported it, people from NPR and the Washington Post, they came back and actually said, oh, we just said that so that Hamas can go under the tunnels and we can bomb them. So they actually admitted to misleading journalists. Then you have, of course, the lies around the killing of Shirin Abu Aqla, which, of course, they were caught uh, blatantly lying that day when Beit Salem um, made their own video showing that it was impossible that a Palestinian fighter killed her. And then, of course, you see the slew of lies and disinformation just in the last seven months. Uh, Al-Shifa Hospital being a Hamas command and control mode. The fact that uh, Hamas carried out mass rape on October 7th, the 40 beheaded babies, and on and on and on. And yet, the media, the Western media, continue to regurgitate what this source that has lied to them repeatedly tells them, right? And you see repeated briefings also by Israeli government and military, as well as uh, airtime. So, I haven't seen a kind of like retro, like uh, introspection in terms of like, should we keep trusting the source or should we actually do our jobs and report stories out before we put them on air, before we go with them? Instead, um, you see the, the New York Times winning a Pulitzer for their, um, you know, Gaza Israel coverage. Um, and you see, you know, other, you see stories flatly, like flat out debunked. For example, the New York Times screams without words a piece about uh, alleged uh, mass rape by Hamas without any kind of retraction, apology, anything. Will that come in the future? I don't know, but it's too late. Like, the time to check this kind of reporting when it has a real world impact, mm -hmm. when it serves only to justify continued mass killing in large numbers is now. It's not, you yeah. know, in the future, it's right now. Yeah. Do you also want to dunk on the question? <laughs> um, I mean, just specifically on the, on the Iraq war, um, you know, one of the main people, uh, uh, like a proponent of the Iraq war, essentially, Judith Miller was saying that they were definitely, definitely, definitely WMD and has still not actually been quiet on Twitter. You really would have thought that she would have, you know, shut up. Um, but in recent months, she's still been uh, expressing Zionist opinions. Um, 
On the impact of Black Lives Matter, I personally don't see it necessarily in the institutions that I'm seeing around me, among my colleagues, I'm seeing it among the student journalists. These are student journalists who have been doing an exceptional, exceptional job in recent months um, amid like very, very explicit smear campaigns who have not only lived through, um, watched Black Lives Matter protests, but also COVID um, have been uh, subject to active shooter drills every single year of their lives. Like they have been radicalized in a way that I hope will change the industry in the future. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I carried out this content analysis study that was actually published by Arab Center DC, and I was, uh, I was looking at Sunday news talk shows on the traditional broadcast networks. And so I have a question kind of about television, um, but I looked at you know, how, many, how many times keywords were mentioned. And one of the keywords I was interested in was genocide, because part of the time that I looked at included the ICJ preliminary uh, ruling. Um, and there were 23 total mentions of genocide, one was in regards to Gaza, that the possibility of genocide being committed in Gaza as it was framed. 20 of the mentions were about chance on college campuses. 20, so a 21 ratio. Um, this, this question that we have online is, why, you know, why are media so easily, especially I think it's probably worse on television, I believe, so I'm looking at you, Leila, uh, though you're not responsible for television. Um, why is it, for example, that there was so much fixation on the river to the sea chant um, as being something you know, inherently problematic, anti-Semitic? What, what accounts for this overemphasis and misrepresentation around the chant? It's a distraction, let's be real. I mean, the amount of coverage these student protests received as literal mass graves were being discovered under Nasser Medical Complex was just staggering. I mean, these are decisions being made, um, you know, to, uh, per, you know, over-focus on manufactured controversies in the face of actual atrocities and, you know, horrific killings. And it's a distraction from what's happening in Gaza. It's uh, smearing the student movements, which are very clear about what they stand for, which is you know, freedom for the Palestinian people who've been under occupation for decades, the longest modern occupation of our time. Um, and instead, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just a smear tactic against these students and a, a distraction and a deflection from what's happening on the ground in Gaza. But you don't just see it with the student protests. You see it with other manufactured, kind of fabricated um, stories that have been pumped, pumped out from the state of Israel or from uh, pro-Israel groups. I mean, but, yeah, I can understand the push factor, but the, the, the pull factor, like why are news media so prone to repeat these things? I mean, when it's, it seems so transparent, a distraction. <laughs> I mean, oh God. <laughs> okay, I'll move on yeah. to a question from the audience. <laughs> oh, that is the official response from Mona. Um, we have a question here um, from Ahmed. I'm sorry, I can't read your last name. Uh, from NPR. Oh. Dahman, thank you. Uh, what can outnumbered editors with experience in the Middle East and work in media, American media do when they believe in trying to make change from within? Mm. Addressed to the panel, especially Akbar, but I'm sure, yeah. So what are these tactics of resistance uh, internally? I just, just, it just sounds uh, almost tried to say, but be really firm. Like, it will be an uphill battle. Every, every word choice, every sentence will be complicated and hard. Be really clear about your sources. I think that that is a really powerful thing and, and sort of saying, look, who are, to your point about the IDF, having a record of, not being honest, who are sources we can look at who have again and again give, given us accountability and new find, findings. And then I think uh, kind of make it clear that this is not just about some philosophical debate, it's about the survival of the institution, right? And this gets back to the point about screen time, readership, whatever. People are dying for fair coverage of what's happening in Gaza. I, I don't know, I, I don't have sort of stats on whether people want to hear more about like from the river to the sea on every student campus, or if they want to hear more about mass graves, I think what the global conversation is telling us is that it's the latter. And making that case again and again, I think, is powerful. 
I think also just appealing to the basic tenets of journalism, right? So a lot of the times editors push back um, because of bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious, and just kind of framing your arguments around, well, is this true? What are we sourcing this? You know, what is this based on? Or sometimes if it's coverage that tends to be more like hum you know, humanistic or sympathetic to Palestinians, but it's actually literally just stating facts, <laughs> like just pointing out, well, this is just stating facts about what's happening. And like Akbar said, just being firm about it and, like I said, appealing to those basic tenets. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. And also just making sure that as much as possible, it's written down. I know it sounds stupid, but mm. they're more than willing to have these conversations over the phone to let you know, unfortunately, we can't publish this piece because of X, Y, Z. Having it written down in an email really, really changes the stakes because they are worried that it's going to get leaked. They're worried it's going to get forwarded and they're going to have to justify their decisions to not publish certain pieces or delete certain paragraphs. 100%. And I'll just say... Um... I, this, is, this is less about newsrooms, but more about just the general tenor of the conversation around the war in Palestine. Um, I, I had sort of a run-in with the White House in January where they accused me of making up quotes and things like this, which was totally untrue. They had no basis. But to your point, that was when I realized there's actually a whole sort... I mean, I knew this was occurring, but I didn't realize the frequency with which there is this off-record pressure call campaign. And I was very clear, everything, every communication we had you say in writing that I made up quotes, you will show me in writing you know, your apology, your traction, or your evidence, and that's it. I'm not mm. getting on the phone with you off the record. I mean, what is that to say? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Um, did you want to add anything else? Uh, we have a, a question here from William Lawrence of American University. Elite newsrooms who should know better, like New York Times and the Washington Post, do agonize over these issues and then make the wrong decisions. Privately, <laughs> privately, they admit mistakes. Um, but the, other, the, the important part of the question here is, should pressure be made more on editors or owners, and who, who's sort of the best positioned actors to do this kind of pressure? But I think there's also another question here, a follow-on, like, what's that power balance between reporters and editors? And is there sort of a, from the public's perspective, is there a good, what's the sort of best pressure point from the outside? So it's both a question of internal dynamics, but sort of media um, critique or media activism from the outside? Where can it direct itself? Just one small change. I think I've thought for a very, very long time, long before uh, October should change in terms of journalistic practices. I don't think the byline should just be the reporter's name. I actually think we should change the style in journalism where editors also have their names attributed to things, and that also changes the stakes of them pressurizing the article to be factually incorrect when there's another full guy on the line that includes themselves. Yeah. That's a really good point. And Reuters does that. You know, I mean, it's, it's, and Reuters is an industry standard. Yeah. But why can't everyone? Yeah, yeah. Both and. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think the pressure can be spread across uh, newsrooms as well as, um, you know, obviously we've seen really um, successful advertising campaigns. You know, for example, companies that have pulled their ads from Fox News, you know, Tucker Carlson's show before um, he left Fox News, and that ended up having a tremendous impact on, on his fate, let's just say. But yeah, obviously pressure from advertisers and on advertisers works as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about, you know, what generates success in terms of getting people to change their coverage and just be fair. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess one, the question also presumes that maybe people understand the, ro the role of the editor. Um, could one of you maybe explain kind of where the editor fits within the news, the news process, news making process, and, and how, do, how do reporters get the job done vis-a-vis -vis the reporter. So you, you mean sort of working level, not editor? In yeah, oh yeah. Um, I will say at the offset, I have the best editors in the world. If you're watching, <laughs> I love you. Um, but, no, 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 no. But, but I actually think, I actually do have amazing editors. And I think, um, and I think the way the process works, your question is editors often are a big part of assignment. Um, they're a big part of framing headlines. Uh, how long will we give to a story? Like, is this a four-hour story or is this a three-day story? Um, and that's a negotiation constantly between the reporter and the editor. I think something that's really helpful, I mean, I've been working during this period, I, I've been kind of spoiled. I have, like, four editors. I kind of bounce ideas off all the time. That's often not the case, right? But having multiple people in that conversation, so it's not just the power dynamic of manager to employee, 
having multiple managers, multiple ideas, viewpoints, that really helps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so. Sometimes when you read an article about Gaza especially, you could tell the most egregious lines were like inserted by an editor because they make no sense. Um, they don't fit. So just a recent example from just a few days ago, there's an article about, um, about how Cindy McCain said there's, there's a famine in Gaza. And there's an article that said, you know, the famine is especially bad. This was in the New York Times, especially in the gang-ridden north. The gang-ridden north and uh, where the Israeli military can't access. So attributing the famine to gangs and lawless gangs in Gaza, um, you could tell that was inserted by an editor. Um, the article bizarrely had like four bylines, but I don't think any of those four reporters actually wrote that line. Um, it ended up getting changed where the, the framing was uh, that it happened after October 7th and after uh, Israeli ground troops came in, but again, mentioning gangs, um, which doesn't really relate to the causality of the famine, but in any, and who created the lawlessness and all of that. Mm -hmm. so, so I think um, it's extremely important to reach out to editors because they do have such a huge role in story selection and framing and, you know, um, like you mentioned, bearing the lead how um, stories are told, and you can't understate or underestimate their role. We have uh, more of a comment than a question mm -hmm. from Sana Saeed of AJ+. The issue of diversity in newsrooms has been brought up a few times. Does not this moment where the propaganda is worse than after 9-11 show that the issues are endemic-systematic as the news industry functions as an extension of US foreign policy? Is reform of a system charged with the dissemination of information possible when everything shows us that the system is just designed this way? OK, I thought that was an exclamation point, but it's a big question mark. <laughs> so is this just like, is this hopeless uh, because it's syst systematically, that the, the journalism is systematically just a function of foreign policy? I think that's a fair question, and I think we've all seen the limits of representation, right? The last few months when, you know, you have um, African-American members of the cabinet who are voting for ceasefire, and this is a point that has been made by others, not just me, uh, or defense minister, uh, min or uh, defense uh, secretary. But um, yeah, I mean, what we've seen largely is obviously there are exceptions, including by people in this room, of excellent journalism in these same outlets, right? Uh, journalism that highlights the suffering of Palestinians. But by and large, the most prominent stories, the ones that receive the front page coverage, the ones that receive wall-to-wall -wall coverage, are the ones that serve to, uh, to justify what's happening in Gaza by the Israeli military. And I think that is systemic. And I think you do see, by and large, a reluctance by um, Western journalists to push back on the policies of the state. And instead, it does sometimes feel like an extension of the state. And that's not the, the purpose of journalism in any way. Mm -hmm. But you rarely see that tension. You rarely see that pushback of foreign policy. Yeah, in my content analysis study, I found that the what was the source of the pro-Israel bias wasn't Israeli officials. It was actually American officials, for, present and former, mm -hmm. um, that they were the ones who were pushing this bias. Did you want to add anything? There was a remarkable moment to that point on Pierce Morgan's show yesterday where he had an Israeli spokesperson, and he kept pushing him about the number of civilian casualties, and he couldn't say it. Yeah. He said, well, you kept telling us what the Hamas ca you know, casualties are. What are this? And he couldn't. He, he just kept pushing and pushing, which is very rare for Pierce Morgan, who's very pro-Israel. But finally, the Israeli spokesperson said, well, your own US defense officials say that we do a really good job protecting civilians. So it shows you kind of, if that's who he's pointing to, how you know, it's sort of indistinguishable um, what US officials and Israeli officials are saying. And oftentimes, even the media are regurgitating those same talking points. Well, I'm curious if you see differences in the UK uh, television-wise versus the US. No. I've been here for 10 years. I don't watch British TV. Okay. I'm sorry. It's OK. I was trying to bring you into the conversation. Sorry. sorry. Uh, no, no problem. <laughs> Uh, Greg uh, Aftandilian, non-resident fellow of the Arab Center, asks, given that most journalists are on the liberal side of the political equation, mm 
how much of the skewed coverage on Gaza is due to their interest in not wanting to criticize the Biden administration? Questions for anyone? I think most journalists would say we are nonpartisan. We, you know, and I do think that there's, I think that number one, obviously that's not true. Journalists have political opinions. They exist in the world just like anyone else. They have interests. They vote for them. You know, anyone who says that they are not political is, is lying to you. Um, but to your point about, to this question's point about the Biden administration and how that got, comes into it, I think looming, and it's, it's interesting it hasn't come up in this conversation, looming everywhere is Donald Trump and the November election, mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of journalists, whether they say it or not, a lot of editors, a lot of newsrooms are thinking about what does tough criticism of Biden mean for his re-election prospects, for the end of potential democracy in America, right? That kind of fear, and I think it's not explicitly stated, but it does run there, and then a tendency not just of this administration, but many democratic administrations, many uh, democratic political campaigns, is to see outlets, I mean, my outlet is center left, to see liberal outlets as almost extensions, like they want us to work for them, right? But you don't work for the Democratic Party establishment, you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of journalists kind of struggle with that relationship and, and acknowledging their own political views. Mm -hmm. I'd say the political spectrum goes from pro-Israel to pro-pro-pro-pro-pro-Israel right now. <laughs> um, and that extends in some ways to the media coverage. I do think this is a hypothetical, so it's hard to know for sure. But I do think if it were Trump who, were, who was in office, we would have seen a lot more pushback both in media and in, in general society. We saw more of that pushback um, when he moved the embassy, for example, to Jerusalem. A lot of the things that he did when he was president um, that didn't involve supporting bankrolling and um, providing weapons to mass killing in Gaza received a lot more pushback than you see now. So I think it's, it's kind of hard to deny that that is a factor. Right. And, I, and I, I just, I, we can draw, see a really clear parallel, uh, obviously very different details, but just the parallel of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi under Donald Trump, which got huge attention, congressional pushback, shifts in policy, the killing of Shreena Abouakleh by an Israeli bullet under this president, right? Um, those are very different moments, and I think we need to have that context. And, and to your point about like, where the spectrum is, yes, everyone in US politics is generally pro-Israel. I think we do our readers a disservice when we don't state that clearly, right? I think because that's also part of the dynamic, right? We, when we say pro-Israel is just APAC, that is ardently, that is hardline pro-Israel, but that is part of what makes officials mm -hmm. say, oh my gosh, I've got to prove I'm even more pro-Israel because you're saying those guys are the only pro-Israel ones, right? I mean, that's a dynamic that journalists contribute to um, and, and kind of should be more thoughtful about. So just giving that context so when the, the Biden administration says Donald Trump is going to end democracy, he cozies after dictators, adding that context, okay, you went to Saudi Arabia and you know, fist bumped MBS, when you were criticizing the murder of Khashoggi. Mm -hmm. I don't know, the only thing I would add to that is just that it's May, and I just can't believe how little election coverage there is. I've never seen anything like it. It feels like journalists don't want to write about it, readers don't want to read about it, everyone's just like, oh God. Um, and that's quite scary, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, related to this, this kind of disparate coverage of um, victims, John of Georgetown University asks, do you think that unfavorable coverage of Israel became, became more prominent in Western media um, when, you know, after the world conflict kitchen, um, uh, humanitarian aid workers were killed? Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if you, if you think about that moment, was that sort of a moment of change in the coverage and is it because of the, the demographics of who was killed? I think nationality matters a lot, American citizens. Unfortunately, I, I see this as someone you know, who is an immigrant. Like, the color of your passport matters a lot um, to coverage. But I also think that was this moment where people thought, oh, this is, journalists are always looking for narratives, right? That was the moment where people thought, this is gonna be the turning point. And suddenly, President Biden is sort of gonna have a cape and end the killing in Gaza. And that was very obvious right, to, to people who'd been following the war, that's not what Biden thinks. Um, but you saw, intense coverage at that point, really, really saying that the Israelis were making huge concessions to Biden when in fact humanitarian aid workers, including Jose Andres, told us that they weren't. Mm -hmm. 
I, mean, I would just say, the, I, I agree, but I would also say the colour of your skin matters more than the yeah. colour of your passport, as Shireen's murder proves. Mm -hmm. um, and that, yeah, there was a, the, it did feel like there was a little bit of a shift, but it wasn't, sus, it wasn't really sustained. I think what has been sustained, much to my surprise, has just been public attention. Like, we've all seen, you know, whether it was Sheikh Jarrah or, like, over the years, all of a sudden there being a little bit of a shift on online and then people losing interest. And the one of the few things that has actually given me hope is that seven months on, I've seen the general public still staying focused on what's happening and that's quite encouraging, yeah. yeah. What, what about the public opinion polls that re more recently come out that show that a large uh, portion of the American public supports a ceasefire, especially among mm. youth, but also is uncomfortable with sending weapons to Israel. So there's all this stuff that's happening with media bias, but I don't think public opinion necessarily reflects that completely. Mm. So to your point, what explains that gap? TikTok? <laughs> I don't know. Is, like, is that why they want to ban it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think social media has disrupted the media landscape in a really, really radical way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't put it all down to TikTok, those, those um, public opinion things. Um, but yeah, also like there is an economic crisis, even if it's not being reported on, there's an economic crisis in terms of cost of living, um, in terms of just quality of life in this country. And I think that has made it much, much harder for people to swallow this idea of um, military spending and arms to Israel, yeah. I would say despite all of the obfuscation, the sort of regurgitation of talking points and propaganda, uh, to Mona's earlier point about the power of images, I think it's undeniable um, how many children have been killed. You know, it's a staggering, horrifying number. The fact that um, Israel's sort of setting this new standard in warfare where civilian targets have just become fair game. So you have the destruction of every single hospital in Gaza, every single university in Gaza. Um, that wholesale destruction of this tiny place I think is horrifying to a lot of people, even if some Americans, according to polls, aren't even sure if more Israelis or Palestinians have been killed. Um, but I just think these very basic facts of what is happening here, what is the objective, what is it, how is it going to leave Gaza after all of this? You know, some are, according to one UN report, it's going to take 80 years to rebuild Gaza. Um, and I just think all of that is just objectively horrifying, and that's where that opposition comes from, but also the fact that people do have much more access to alternative media, to people on the ground telling their own stories, to, to horrifying images that we can't unsee. Uh, there's a question here that relates to the, the sort of paradigm of objectivity uh, in journalism. Um, Richard Coleman's asking for comment on the use of terminology that describes uh, sides, quote unquote, of this conflict, pro-Palestinian for those who are anti-genocide, um, and anti-Semitic for those who are opposed to Israel's killing of non-combatant, mischaracterizing the issues also just through these like sort of binaries. Um, but yeah, it, may, it does make me think about, you know, the notion of objectivity and how it gets sort of employed, you know, that you have to have both sides. Uh, is, this, is this a convention that doesn't serve us well? Well, it's, also, it's also a convention that's not applied consistently. So again, to go to the Pulitzer Prizes, it was awarded to the journalists of Ukraine, but when it came to Gaza, it was awarded to journalists reporting on Gaza, which was an effort for both sidesism. So when does the both sides argument get wielded and when is it set aside in the name of factual reporting? Yeah, and I just think like, to your point about it's not a constant standard, one example that was so blatant was the Hamas-run health ministry, the mm. Gaza health ministry, local authorities, who is the health ministry? Yeah. It's the health ministry of the place. I mean, that's, that's where it was. And, and news outlets freaked out. You saw them panic, right? Suddenly, for weeks, Hamas-run was everywhere. It's not everywhere now. So if the, if the standard was universal, shouldn't it have been there always? And shouldn't it be there now? No, there was a moment where newsroom leaders felt really under attack. And that tells us that are they being guided, to your point, to keep going back to these basic tenets of journalism, or are they being guided by public criticism and, and fear? Right? Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Andrew uh, Labor, I think, uh, Tulane University. While well, Western newsrooms have been hollowed out across the board, has Israel-Palestine <coughs> coverage been especially hollowed out within MENA coverage over the past decade due to a focus on the uh, Saudi-Iran Cold War and regional civil wars, or are there other sort of factors for 
there there have been less sort of um, institutional dedication to Israel Palestine. I mean, yeah, I think so, and I think um, that's partly why October 7th came as such a surprise to some people, because they just haven't been paying attention to what's happening to Palestinians. Um, you definitely see, you know, just when anything happens to Israelis is when you see a recommitment to covering that issue, um, whereas the violence of Palestinians, the daily violence, the daily uh, humiliation, the daily indignities of the occupation are just something that aren't newsworthy or aren't covered um, regularly. I think it's, it's part of a larger trend of pulling back on international coverage um, due to budget reasons and other staffing issues. But also I think there's just a sense of you know, the status quo, the normal being when it's Palestinians being subjected to daily violence that's just considered not newsworthy. And all that does is, is make us you know, ignorant of, or make readers uh, ignorant of the realities on the ground for them. I think that, that tells you something too about government and media and the relationship, right? So to your point, we weren't talking as much about Palestine 2022, 2023, because the Biden administration told us, we're not talking about Palestine. We're talking about China. We're going to fix China. The only thing in the Middle East is the Saudi deal. That's the only thing that matters. And I think because reporters often are driven by not just government sources, but are driven by a kind of this direction from Washington, they're not thinking, is this still an important story to tell? Should I still actually be looking at the fact that the US is deeply implicated in Israel-Palestine in every part of the Middle East? Um, and you see this in a lot of coverage. I mean, you see this in the fact that Egypt, which is going through a historic wave of repression, has gotten nowhere near the amount of coverage despite you know, continued American aid, despite the close relationship, mm -hmm. not even talking about Palestine at all, just talking about what's happening within there. There's not an investment from the US newsrooms to bring that to an American audience. That's your second biggest recipient of US military aid every single year. Mm -hmm. It's bizarre. Mm -hmm. and, and also, you could point to Yemen and the strategies um, of, of, of uh, mobilization, solidarity with, with Palestine. You know, there was a lot of coverage when it was first happening, but we haven't heard, it, heard much about it. But the U.S. sort of wakes up to Yemen every two years, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's been interesting. I've seen this in my, in my own career, kind of writing on Yemen, and people who've talked about it consistently, like mm -hmm. Chris Murphy, have been lone voices in the wilderness bringing it up again and again. And what's so interesting about that example is these are the same officials who oversaw Obama's you know, approval of military support to the Saudis in Yemen. And there isn't an accountability for how did they get to a place where they approved bombing in 2015, and now in 2024, they are launching a new bombing campaign, which they publicly say won't work against the same group. Mm -hmm. Any other points on that? One, one question I have is, uh, and maybe there's an obvious answer here, but you know, I'm struck by how little we actually hear um, officials from Hezbollah or Hamas, like in U.S. news media reporting. Is this is this like a formalized? Ban? Do these groups not want to speak to Western reporters? Why? Why is it that we don't hear from any official sources on the other side, uh, especially on television? I don't. I just don't see them represented at all. They're constantly sort of being represented, as opposed to, to sort of speaking directly to to the audience. I think they're naturally distrustful of speaking to a lot of journalists, uh -huh. given the coverage. Like, why would you answer that phone and expect mm -hmm. to have any kind of an honest and frank conversation with a journalist on the other side? And I also think, um, you know, uh, the situation in Gaza is so horrific that there isn't, there aren't many people who are available to be doing comms and press right now. Like. But even the leadership like in, that's in uh, Qatar and yeah, Syria yeah, yeah. and Lebanon. Yeah. So is it, it, you, you're saying it's mostly on the group side? No, I think it's both. I think it's both. Oh, okay. yeah. I think there's an unstated ban on, on putting their opinions. Yeah. You know, they record videos. They have spokespeople willing mm -hmm. to speak out. But I think um, there's an unstated ban about hearing mm -hmm. from them because they're just dismissed, you know, as terrorists, um, and that's it. There's just a lack of curiosity, lack of interest. It's it's a complete abandonment of what it means to 
practice journalism, right? Even Al Jazeera puts Israeli officials all the time, Israeli you know, military uh, people, whatever they say, they put their comments. There isn't, Al Jazeera is literally more balanced in its coverage than these American networks which have zero curiosity, interest, initiative, or willingness to put uh, what these actors, and they are actors on the ground, have to say about things. And that just leaves people missing a big part of the equation. Uh, we have a question from uh, Anwar uh, Kurdi from Amer Arab Americans of Cleveland. While I understand that Palestine is a cause for all, I personally feel that many pro-Palestine voices amplified are of non-Palestinians. How do we change that? How do we create and share a Palestinian media playbook? I think part of the problem is that when Palestinians do appear in, uh, and give media interviews, people like Yusuf Munayyad, who's here, or Noor Araqat, you see that they're often put, even though they're experts, they're put in the hot seat as if they're the accountability interview, right? You even see that with people in Gaza who've lost family members who are often asked, well, were, they, were your family members Hamas, right? So even like any kind of Palestinian who subjects themselves to uh, being covered by the media is automatically considered untrustworthy unless pro proven otherwise, has to prove their humanity, has to prove that what they're saying is true has to denounce Hamas, right? That's the first question that Pierce Morgan asks anybody who comes on the show. And of course, you see a different type of treatment for Israeli officials who actually have power to change the policy on the ground, who actually can and, and should be held accountable, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I'm not quite answering the question, but I think in terms of what happens to Palestinians when they do uh, agree to give interviews, oftentimes they're censored, their um, you know, time is cut or limited, or their segments don't air at all, or they're put in the hot seat and required uh, to answer accountability interviews, which is also what we saw with the USC valedictorian who went on Abby Phillips' show and was subjected to an intense questioning that we never see Israeli officials be subjected to. And also being sort of compelled to condemn before before one can speak. It's like you, you can't say anything until you condemn Hamas. And that's that's a compulsion that we don't see kind of with pro-Israeli guests, like condemn the, the murder of, of children, for example. That never, that, that never happens. Um, not a question, but an invitation for Mona. Love your insights on Western media. So we've got some fan mail here. Uh, <laughs> Ever noticed how human rights groups and press freedom orgs talk about Israel? Could be an interesting angle to explore. Wonder if they're as passive as the mainstream media. Have you looked at NGOs or other kinds of organizations outside of the media? Or I haven't recently, no, no, no. Yeah, I should. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good idea. Uh, any, any comments from you guys about, about the nonprofit advocacy? Or, or how about professional journalistic organizations? Um, do you see them showing any solidarity with Palestinian journalists? I've been very disappointed. Um, I would say there's been some solidarity, but it hasn't met the moment at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been insufficient. Um, it's been, there's been a lot of silence. I mean, if this were happening anywhere else in the world, there would be so much more outrage and grief and anger and call to action. Mm -hmm. Um, I, my program did an episode a couple of years ago about the killing of journalists in Mexico because it's a place where many journalists are killed and targeted by various actors there. And just to give you a sense of the scope of the t killing and targeting of Palestinian journalists, which I know you're going to get into in the next panel, um, more journalists have been killed in Gaza in seven months than have been killed in Mexico in 20 years. And Mexico is one of the deadliest places for journalists. So. Whatever has been said hasn't been enough. It's been appalling, and I think part of it is that they simply don't view Palestinian journalists as journalists in a lot of yeah. cases. Yeah. Um, they you know, are so demonized and dismissed that they simply just don't merit that solidarity, and it's been very disappointing. I've been to a few events for journalists over the past few months, especially in the first few months of, of the Ansar on Gaza, and there wasn't a word spoken on the situation of journalists in Gaza. And, you know, I left one of them, you know, early because I was so upset at that lack of solidarity and compassion and support. I mean, again, you can just look at the Pulitzer. It's supposedly like the most prestigious award in our industry. Um, and, you know, I, I emailed the board in March asking them why they hadn't said anything. 
Um, and at the time that I emailed them, the Pulitzer Prize's um, Twitter account, its last activity, I emailed them in March, was um, tweeting out a Thanksgiving recipe in November. Um, and they hadn't said anything since then. They've now become like a little bit more vocal, but still in their statements, they've They've, you know, they issued this statement before they met to award the prizes, acknowledging what student journalists have, have been exposed to, but not actually commenting on the reason why those student journalists are so impassioned, which is the murder of Palestinian journalists. Um, so, yeah, really, really disappointing. Yeah. And I, I saw a video of you when you received the Pulitzer, and you made a very powerful uh, statement uh, with that. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you... Did you get a lot of sort of private, you know, thumbs up from people? I mean, what was the response to that? Nothing, nothing, no, no, just nothing. Ignored I left, you? Absolutely. I left. Uh, I left before dessert was served. I didn't want to be in that room. Uh, this was, you know, I actually really don't love what I said. I was very, very nervous and anxious. It was October nineteenth, I believe. Yeah. Um, and as I was on my way out the door, which I think really speaks to. Uh, the way that the industry operates more broadly. Someone very senior at the Pulitzer Committee, I'm actually not sure who it was, was like, and I was still crying as I was like trying to leave without literally just with my head down. Somebody was like, oh, can I just, uh, can I just quickly say, the reason why we say um, Israel, Gaza is because not everyone supports Hamas. And I was like, I don't understand what you're even trying to say to me right now. Like, did you think that my critique was that you hadn't... And also, not everyone in Israel supports the Netanyahu government. You still refer to it as a state. Like, I, I don't understand. I was just like, what are you saying? Um, and then I was like, oh, I don't really think this is, you know, helpful. And he was like, can I just ask one thing really, really quickly? Are you related to Ahmed Chalabi? <laughs> um, so, for those who don't know, um, <laughs> um, Ahmed Chalabi was uh, one of the people who repeatedly claimed that there were WMD in Iraq. Um, he was the person that the Americans tried to install. After they ousted Saddam, uh, the Iraqis <laughs> did not like him, not least because he hadn't been in the country for 20 years. Um, and no, I'm not related to Ahmed Chalabi. <laughs> um, but I am Iraqi. And, um, you know, I was like, well done, bro, you know another Iraqi. Um, but I, I, I'm not totally sure of this, so I want to couch this. I, I have recently come to learn that the chair of the Pulitzer Committee was the editor of Judith Miller, who again was the New York Times journalist who was claiming that they were WMD. And I don't know if that guy who had stopped me <laughs> is the person who was editing these articles saying that there are WMD. Like, I just, I just couldn't, anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really understand what the point of what I'm saying is, except to say that like, um, there's, n I don't know. I'm just, I'm just an Arab in those spaces. There aren't many other Arabs. Uh, and my position, even before I have opened my mouth, is assumed to be pro-Palestinian by mere fact of how I look and what my name is. It turns out that's correct. Um, <laughs> um, and so there's actually very little in some ways for me to lose by stating facts. This is an opinion, facts that I know to be true because it's assumed to be my stance regardless, even if I'm silent. Um, and, yeah, I don't know what else to say except that I would have never, ever, ever won the Pulitzer for reporting on the Middle East at all, let alone Palestine, because I am also assumed to be untrustworthy, and it's, Palestinians are assumed to be the most untrustworthy on Palestine. There is a spectrum. It's Palestinians, absolutely, you can't trust a single thing that comes out of their mouths. Maybe some Arabs, all the way up to uh, white men, ideally, who are the most trustworthy sources that we have on the Middle East. Yeah. And of course, the New York Times won a Pulitzer for its international reporting. <laughs> uh, Layla, you know, you one of your um, great greatest social media sort of routines has been to criticize New York Times, and you know, I, I, I think of you as the the informal sort of ombuds person <laughs> for the New York Times <laughs> since they got rid of theirs uh, what five years ago or so. Um, we had a, we did have a question about some of the reporting on the. Uh, the allegations around sexual violence on October 7th. Um, and that's something that you've been very vocal, along with several others, uh, in, in calling out the New York Times for. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what kind of feedback you've gotten about your feedback? Sure. I mean, allegations of sexual violence are very serious, right? And they should be taken seriously and they should be made in a serious manner. Um, I don't think anybody who's criticized, particularly the New York Times is reporting, but there's also been others like The Guardian, um, 
you know, many Western news organizations have, have kind of gone with um, the Israeli propaganda campaign about um, a, a specific, you know, allegations around October 7th and alleged mass rape on October 7th. Um, they haven't been critical, they haven't said, like, we don't believe any rape happened on October 7th. No one can say that. No one knows whether that's true or not. What they are saying is that the reporting behind uh, these claims simply doesn't stand up to any kind of scrutiny, right? So you have sources who've been completely discredited because they've been ha found to have lied. Uh, one example is a, a so-called, you know, alleged paramedic. We don't know his name. He went by G in... Um, in uh, Jake Tapper's report on CNN, but he was also featured in a New York Times article uh, called Screams Without Words that came out on December 28th that has now been largely totally debunked but has not, not been retracted by the New York Times. So this paramedic said that he'd seen the bodies of two girls who, uh, in, in a kibbutz biri who appeared to have been raped. A video actually came out even after like all of this criticism of the article of you know, not standing up to scrutiny, not show, you know, providing evidence for its very inflammatory claims. Uh, a video showed that that wasn't true, simply wasn't true. The kibbutz itself um, denied that it happened. And yet what the New York Times did was embed a little update in the, inside the article saying, update, you know, we found out that this video shows that it wasn't true. In any other case, it's like there's a completely different set of standards. In any other case of journalism, that piece would be retracted. It would be um, removed, you know, or, or at least, you know, there'd be a big retraction at the top saying, actually, we can't support the claims in this article. Also, the family of the one woman who was named, named Gal Abdouche, um, as, as being a person who was raped on October 7th, said they didn't believe that it was actually possible, that they didn't believe it, that the first they'd heard of it was when the New York Times approached them. Um, it came out basically that the Israeli government was supplying all of these you know, so-called witnesses and sources for news organizations, that there was this coordinated effort to do that, um, and on and on and on. I mean, one of the main uh, New York Times sources for that article um, photographed himself smiling and the thumbs up when at the same time that he was supposedly witnessing horrific acts. He initially said that he saw um, one woman, uh, sorry, many women being raped by civilian fighters, not even Hamas fighters, but Palestinian civilians. He then went on to say that it was actually a gang rape. So all of this sort of contradictory um, testimony that just showed that it, you know, none of it um, stood up to scrutiny and should be retracted. And it was very clear that, you know, with each point in the invasion of Gaza and the mass killing there, there were these very sensationalist claims. Again, Hamas using hospitals as, as command modes, nodes, um, you know, Hamas committed mass rape, 40 beheaded babies, all of that was meant to garner support and to kind of excuse um, Israeli violence against Palestinians. I'll just add, I, I, in that really useful chronology you had, one data point that to me has really stood out, and I feel like we're constantly going back to echoes of the war on terror, right, which I agree with you, I do not think that was a mea culpa. Sorry, Will. Um, <laughs> But I will, I'll just never forget how when the, the first truce, you know, aid, uh, hostage release, all that collapsed, within two days you saw this huge inflammatory report saying Hamas uh, torpedoed the deal because they don't want to let go hostages who, uh, of hostages who have been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. That claim went away immediately, right? But that became a one-week conversation about did the deal fall apart because of sexual abuse of hostages? We haven't heard that in any other part of the hostage negotiations. Mm -hmm at a point where it was very useful for the US administration and Israel to talk about that, and we don't know. We do not know if hostages have been sexually abused. Some have said they were. But just strategically leaking it at that moment echoes so many moments from the war on terror. To me, it's the way that gender was brought up in the invasion of Afghanistan, right? This idea of we are here, we're here to shield the women, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. That kind of really cynical use of leaks has been jarring to me. And there are credible, uh, you know, proven examples of Palestinian women and men and boys being subject to rape, to sexual abuse, harassment, uh, whatever it is in detention, killings, torture, that don't receive nearly the same amount of coverage that these fabricated and debunked allegations have received. So you see, once again, a double standard in terms of what's worthy of coverage and what isn't.
Well, I want to thank uh, you, tremendous uh, panel, and for sharing your wisdom and your insight and giving us a lot of food for thought and, and tips on, on how to interface with the media better. Um, I learned a lot, and I invite the audience to join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you.